2005, uh, there were uh, 241 uh, infant deaths which were uh, classified as being due to termination of pregnancy. Now, you, to understand that, you need to know that a death is not described as an infant death unless the child is first born alive because you are not a human being unless you make it to being born alive. So these 40 to 50 children a year were born alive but then died subsequently of injuries sustained in the course of termination of pregnancy. Now technically uh, that's against the law but I've checked and uh, there have been no prosecutions uh, of that because at the time the injuries are sustained those children are not considered to be human beings uh, under Canadian law and therefore it's anything goes. So uh, if you wanted uh, an existing concrete example that would be the closest I could come. But I'm more concerned about what happens to Canada if we abandon the consensus that one's worth and dignity are inherent based on who you are as a human being, not based on some law that falsely says you're not a human being. That would be a dark future for Canada. Can you just, as a follow-up, can you just clarify those uh, 241? Uh, so what, they, they, were, they were born at what, six months, seven months, and then they decide to unplug them because they were not... Uh, no, no, uh, regrettably born. the um, gestational age of uh, children is rarely reported, so I have no idea of, of that. Uh, I, I simply know what Statistics Canada recorded, and that is that these were infant deaths, children who were born alive, but whose death was caused as a result of termination of pregnancy, which of course is simply the phrase we use for abortion. Tonda McCharles. Um, Mr. Woodworth, you just came out of your caucus. Um, what kind of support do you have in there? Well, uh, I, I, I haven't finished talking to everybody, believe it or not, uh, but uh, I know that the Prime Minister's position has likely depressed uh, the support that I might uh, have received from some people. In what sense? Well, why, just because they've heard the PM speak, why do you think, what do you think of your colleagues who are changing their mind because the PM doesn't want them to vocalize support for you? Well, you know, um, long, long ago in the practice of law, I realized that uh, it's impossible for me to look into someone's mind in, the, in that fashion. And so, uh, quite frankly, uh, I don't judge anyone's heart uh, or conscience. Uh, I simply judge their policy. Uh, and uh, so whatever reasons uh, people have for uh, not supporting what I regard to be the Canadian heritage of respectful dialogue when we have differences, of uh, defense of the principle of universal human rights, and of a commitment to honest laws. But, you know, those, that's my policy. Whatever pr reasons people have for not supporting that, I leave for them to tell you. Can you quantify it? Pardon me? Can you quantify your caucus support? Uh, not easily. Uh, I would uh, only say that uh, uh, although uh, we have a majority in the House, I don't expect to have a majority of uh, support for Motion 312 at this point. Although I know people are continuing to contact their members of Parliament, tens of thousands of people uh, from across Canada, and uh, perhaps that will have a beneficial effect. Fanny Olivier, Press Canadian. Hi. Um, the government is repeating that the priority is the economy. And some um, MPs, some ministers came out of the caucus today saying they don't want your motion to distract uh, the government from its priority, which is the economy. And they don't want what to distract? Your motion. To well, my motion? Yeah. So I was just wondering what do you make of that? Well, I, I think if you take a look at the private members' business uh, roster, uh, you'll find that there are lots of uh, motions and even uh, bills being proposed which are not economic uh, and certainly which don't have immediate economic effect. Uh, I agree uh, that uh, the government's priority uh, should remain, top priority should remain the economy. I don't disagree with that. 
uh, and I fully support that. And as I said earlier, I think uh, Canada is very fortunate that we have a government uh, which is so competently focused on the economy. But uh, to say that uh, there should be no private members' bills uh, or motions about anything else, I don't think anyone is suggesting that. Uh, and, and after all, a, a motion such as I'm proposing uh, will take up at the very most uh, two and a half hours of uh, parliamentary time. It's not a huge amount, uh, particularly in relation to the very urgent uh, and important questions that we're talking about. And if my motion passes, uh, we will have a uh, committee which will uh, decide its own schedule. But again, it won't be a, a huge amount of time in relation to other things like you know, fisheries and oceans and the justice committee and uh, so on, which are not necessarily economic. We we'll go back to uh, my colleague's question about uh, the MPs that might have given you uh, their support before and are changing their mind with the Prime Minister's position. Do you think they fear some kind of, uh, they fear something special? Do you think they could be punished? Well, uh, first of all, I should clarify what I meant to say because I didn't mean to say that anyone had given me their support and changed their mind. Uh, what I really meant to say is that I know that uh, there are members in the um, Conservative caucus, and I'm sure in the opposition caucus also, who share my view of the importance of universal human rights and honest laws, uh, but uh, who might uh, be dissuaded from supporting this motion for uh, w whatever reason. Uh, but I uh, have not, uh, uh, you know, if anyone has. I, quite honestly, it's not in my head right now, but if anyone had told me a reason, I have a strict rule that I don't repeat private conversations publicly, so uh, you will have to ask uh, them for their reasons. I will only say for myself that uh, doing the right thing in this or anything else, I don't find to be a problem uh, because I focus myself on the question before me. I don't let myself get distracted by imaginary fears or, or foolish complacencies or, or regrets from the past. I look at the very question before me, and, and what, doing what's right is very often a very easy thing to do. Andrea Houston from Extra. Hi. Um, the, uh, the far right, the conservative Christian right, have really latched on uh, on some of the blogs and some of the uh, conservative websites. They, there's a lot of hope within your motion that it will eventually roll back women's rights. Um, is it your hope that ultimately if your motion passes that you will limit access to abortion, limit access to women's health care? Well, first of all, let me address something in the preamble of your question about rolling back uh, women's rights. I really uh, w recommend to Canadians everywhere that they look at the motion and see that it uh, specifically denies the committee the opportunity uh, to roll back anything that the Supreme Court of Canada or our Constitution says. So uh, my hope for this motion does not include uh, rolling back anything that the Supreme Court of Canada or our Constitution says. Uh, my hope for this motion is that by doing what Canadians do best, talking to one another and examining uh, the evidence, uh, that uh, we will be moved to uh, a consensus about uh, when a child becomes a human being. And uh, let the implications of that uh, be what ever they are, if, if, if deciding that a child is a human being five days before birth has some implication for abortion, uh, so be it. Uh, whatever justification we come up with for abortion, let us surely not uh, base a, a justification on a, a fraud or a pretense about whether or not a child is a human being. That just, I just don't understand the mentality that even thinks that way. So again, though, like you say if it has implications for abortion. If it does. If it does. In what way? How do you envision that? Like, I, do, I don't accept what I've already said, which is that perhaps uh, if uh, Canadians uh, think of a, of a child at uh, eight and a half months gestation as a human being, maybe they will have second thoughts about abortion. But I don't know that. It's also the law. Well, in any respect. But I really don't know that, and I don't think Canadians know that, because we haven't examined the evidence. 
first things first. Okay, one last question. I think that's about it. That first. But don't you think that women themselves have given this a lot of thought, and, and you know, they have already decided if, if you say well, it, maybe maybe women will give it a second thought. Don't you think that women already? give this a lot of thought? I, I think that Parliament hasn't given it much thought, and uh, my purview is in Parliament. And uh, surely uh, Justice Bertha Wilson, whose uh, quotation uh, I have showed you, she gave it a lot of thought. And she was a, a highly intelligent woman, a feminist, impeccable feminist credentials. She gave it a lot of thought, and the conclusion she came to uh, was that the rights and interests of children before birth ought to be uh, protected uh, before the end of the second uh, trimester of their development. So uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, women have, uh, but Parliament, uh, I don't think, has really come to grips with that. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup.